What big tech news from 2022 we're going to carry over into 2023? What will be the next killer app or technology that dominates the year? And will we ever stop talking about the pandemic? We're going to cover those topics and more on Today in Tech. Welcome back to Today in Tech. I'm Keith Shaw. We've got a big panel of really cool people to talk about the technology trends for 2023. Joining me today is Ken Mingus. He's the executive editor of Computer World. Mark Ferranti, he's the executive editor for News at Foundry, which is also an IDG company. And John Gold, a senior news writer at Computer World. <laughs> Welcome to the show, everybody. Hey, Thank you. you. Nice. Happy New Year. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Happy New Year, all you guys. I'm, I'm glad you guys are, are, are all uh, agreed to do this. And uh, let's just jump right into it. Uh, the top 12 tech stories of 2022. This was an article on Computer World that uh, John kind of put together, uh, along with Mark, uh, where you looked back, you know, back at the biggest technology stories from last year. And so what I want to ask everybody is, how many of these, these topics do we think will then carry over into 2023? We're already seeing that, and it's only one week into January. Um, I think, you, you know, again, the, one of the biggest continual problems for, for technology in the IT group at a lot of companies is this chip war that's going on between the U.S. and China. A lot of the chip shortages. Mark, like, kind of explain sort of what, what, what happened last year and then, you know, how far into 2023 this might happen or continue. Right. Sure. Well, the, the chip war, as we call it, make no mistake about it, it's a big deal. It's going to have ramifications probably for the rest of the decade. Um, so what are we talking about? Um, so recently what happened in October and December, the Biden administration put restrictions on American exports to China of certain advanced chips, particularly chips involved in AI and semiconductor making equipment. So there were restrictions announced in October and then in December, they affect, I believe, over 50 companies at this point. And uh, specifically, there are restrictions on GPUs, right, graphical processing units, TPUs, tensor processing units, and other advanced uh, application-specific integrated circuits, mainly focused around uh, technology that, that goes into artificial intelligence uh -huh. applications. And the stated purpose of the restrictions is to deny China access to advanced technology for military modernization and human rights abuses. But the new trade rules really come at a time when the U.S. is getting increasingly worried about China's ge growing geopolitical power and are going to affect not only computer equipment, but many consumer products built on the restricted semiconductor technology. Uh, they also really signaled the end of uh, the era of ever, explan uh, ever expanding globalization. Right. Right. Because when you think about it, there are a lot of different products built on these 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 chips. Right. You know, not just AI applications, but high performance computers, uh, electronic vehicles and the list goes goes on and on. So, you know, the first disruption will occur, obviously, for big Chinese companies like uh, Alibaba and Baidu, but the supply chain effect is going to ripple around the world. Is is this a different issue than the supply chain shortages that we saw sort of post pandemic or the or at least after the first wave of the pandemic? Is that is this different than a lot of the chip shortages that happened there? Uh, and, and and that wave hasn't happened yet, so we're, we might see even more shortages coming forward because it did seem like a lot of the supply chain and logistics issues that we saw in 2020 sort of eased in 2021 and 2022. At least it got, it, you know, I could buy some, some, some phones and things like that, that I, that I couldn't get in 2021. Do you think that yeah, this, is gonna, this is the next shortage is, is about to happen or are you already seeing that? Uh, well, I mean, the restrictions were just put in place. So, yeah. well, first of all, to answer your question, yes, it is different. It's okay. a different thing, all right? right? Because, the first supply chain issue involving chips was due to lockdowns of the pandemic. So these are, you know, Biden administration restrictions put on more advanced chips. So it is a different like way. It's, it'll be a different sort of supply chain disruption. OK. And, yeah, and, and you know, keep, go ahead, just to jump in real quick, talking about the, the supply chain, because I do think that's going to be one of the issues that's going to continue to to bubble up over, you know, in 2023. And, and as Mark may mentioned earlier, over the, the decade, it's not just there's a lot going on with chips, supply chain, 
Here in the U.S., you've got these serious efforts at reshoring and bringing chip manufacturing back to the U.S. You've got companies trying to figure out, like Apple, for instance, and I know we wanted to talk about that a little bit down the road, uh, looking to, to basically reconfigure their supply chains because they don't really want to have all of their hardware made in China. So you've got all of these kind of cross currents that are sort of impacting you know, a lot of tech companies, whether they are making things in China, relying on products from China that rely on these chips. You've got, you know, the government jumping in with the with the Biden administration uh, on the, you know, as we started talking about, and then also this effort to bring chip manufacturing back to the U.S. So there's there's a lot of things going on at once. And I don't think we quite know exactly, you know, where we're going to find the pain points. Yeah. It- you that's know, in the, terms that's of, what I wanted to yeah, mention, go ahead, John. actually, is go ahead. that it's, you know, it's so hard to, you know, this is so complicated. And to my understanding is, you know, not how it is, you know, largely unprecedented in the, you know, the annals of how the tech industry actually functions. So, like, you know, it's just incredibly difficult to figure out, um, like Ken said, you know, exactly, you know, where this is going to wind up, you know, how this is going to affect companies uh, going forward. So. Yeah, if, if you are sort of in charge of... of uh, you know, if you're a CIO or if you're an IT leader and you're trying to like figure out what to do, you've probably already started working on your l- supply chain and logistics, correct? You certainly you know, should have. And and obviously, oh, yeah. manufacturing, getting manufacturing to come back to the U.S. shores, it, it's you know, it's like turning a tanker, a, a big tanker around. It's it's going to take a while. It's not going to be immediately. You can't just open a factory because it's in America, right? Like, there's a lot of steps that happen. Do you think that that'll still happen, or will? Or you think you know companies might just take a wait and see and and wait for the the waves to settle, so to speak? Well, we're already you know, foreign chip makers are already have already announced plans you know over the last few months to build factories here in the United States, but you know we have to realize it's going to take years yeah. before the United States is supplying. Uh, a decent amount of, you know, a decent quantity of, of advanced chips. Um, here's one data point, right? TSMC, right? The big Taiwanese-based uh, manufacturer is building a plant in Phoenix, but they're not going to be building uh, uh, two nanometer chips there for another few years. Whereas I think by this year, they're going to be producing those chips in Taiwan. So, you know, it'll be minimum three to five years before we sort of catch up to nearly where we're, we want to be. So and it might take really the rest of the decade, actually. I just want to throw one more wrench into this into this uh, <laughs> game plan as we're talking about it, since we're thinking ahead. But, you know, at the same time that the companies are dealing with supply chain issues and concerns about chips and manufacturing, you know, we still have the ongoing issue of tech talent. And especially in terms of of moving some of this back to the U.S., yes, it certainly takes a long time to get a chip manufacturing plant, you know, approved, sited, built, up and running. But you've got to have people that know what they're doing running it. And at least in the U.S., you know, there's, again, I'm going to use this word again, cross currents in terms of being able to find tech talent here that, you know, can, can operate these facilities. So you've got, you know, and this is true. It's not just true of manufacturing or even chip makers. It's true of, of the tech industry at large in terms of you've got so much churn with people, with employees, with talented employees yeah. who are changing jobs, demanding remote work, you know, trying to figure out what a hybrid workplace means. You've got hiring managers who can't find them at work. Is, aren't, you know, there are issues with inflation yep. and salaries. And it's just a, a very unsettled world we're living in. John made the point that this is very different from, you know, the, the setup we're all used to in terms of technology and manufacturing and supply chains. It, it's sort of fallout from the pandemic, but it's not directly, you know, the pandemic is sort of waning. It's sort of the after effects now. And it's, right. it's going to take a long time to settle down. Yeah, a lot of those trends, right. you know, are, are one of the reasons why robotics and automation have mm-hmm. been such a hot topic for a lot of the manufacturers out there. Um, again, if you, do, you, you don't want to build a new factory in the U.S. and then, man, you know, build it with factory workers from the 1980s or 1990s. The workers you're going to need are going to n- need to know how to operate robots and, and work with robots. And I think that's 
that's sort of driving the adoption of more robots in manufacturing and, and supply chain and warehouses and things like that. So um, it's good for the robotics industry or people that make robots. But but again, you still have a talent you know mm-hmm. shortage on, yeah. on almost yeah. any any kind of given uh, sector. John, were you going to jump in with something else? And then I was going to ask one more. Yeah, question. I was I'm just going to say yeah. per uh, Ken's cross currents. You know, it's just, it it feels like you know to answer the basic question of whether or not it's a you know, companies are going to be able to just kind of wait and see. It's, you know, the answer is kind of they can't, you know, at this point. It's, it's yeah. a very 2020 story in that, you know, it's a massive, you know, uh, sort of sea change that's happening, you know, right now. And companies are having to deal with the immediate effects right now. But we're, you know, again, we're still talking about consequences that, you know, I feel like most people just have no idea because it's, you know, we we've, we've never had to cope with something. It does like seem before. like it's a kind of a downer to talk to jump off with that one. I was hoping that there's is <laughs> well, there any good news in this in this area with the chip shortages? Is there anything that some sort of silver nugget or gold nugget that we can well, kind of take out of this? Maybe it, it will make uh, the U.S. Uh, get get more serious about education, STEM education for young people. I mean, that's the only way. Uh, and the uh, Western allies. I mean, that's the only way uh, you know we're going to be able to handle these disruptions, uh, and 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 the new technology uh, that that that's evolving. Uh, and, and but to go back to a point that 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 you made, uh, Keith, uh, CIOs, you know, multiple sources have been telling us uh, that CIOs need to reassess their vendor selection criteria. Uh, from the the standpoint of supply chain resiliency, right, uh, and to John's points as well, John's point as well, you know, how exposed are they to, for example, the China semiconductor chip right. uh, issue? You know, they need to identify potential uh, vulnerabilities in high end high tech projects. You know, including enterprise high performance computing and. And, Does uh, that mean yeah, that looking like that. looking at startups that are that are in this space, or looking at 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 sort of just diversifying uh, who you're working with? Well, looking at you know their bill of materials, for example, where where are their supplies coming from? Where are the components coming from? Yeah, uh, are key components coming from China? If so, maybe we better look for you know other suppliers in other countries. Right, right, right. Yeah, I think that's you know a, that's a really good broader point. Is that you know I think it will. You know, on both, you know, in the on the manufacturing side and, you know, on the, you know, um, and on the enterprise side, you know, it's going to shake a lot of complacency out. Like, yeah. you know, it's you, it, it's important to remember that, you know, the reasons that we got these, um, you know, these new policies in place from the, from the Biden administration um, and I think even the Trump administration uh, before, you know, the, these aren't necessarily this isn't pure protectionism. This is, you know, these aren't crazy concerns without wading into, you know, exactly how valid you know, any of the, you know, possible security impacts are, you know, these, you know, like I say, it's not just protectionism. This isn't some, you know, kind of off the wall, you know, conspiracy theory about potential security risks. All right. So maybe the, maybe the silver lining is, as you say, it's a wake up call to the U.S. and our and Western allies about uh, education, about bringing some manufacturing back to our own shores. But again, this yeah. is this is something that's not going to be fixed in six months. So no, yeah, no. One one more quick point, yeah. Keith, before we move on. You know, I, I literally was just editing a story that we've got in Computer World today um, from Johnny Evans, who covers Apple, and it's about Apple's efforts to reorient its supply chain and start making products in India and Vietnam and other places. So it's not just the U.S. There are other countries that will see some success here as these big tech firms move in and diversify their manufacturing. Uh, I mean, again, it's it's not U.S., but, uh, you know, there are a lot of places where these devices, hardware, iPhones, whatever can be made. Right. And I think you're going to see other companies doing the same thing, you know, not necessarily leaving China. But again, you want to spread that around so that you can minimize disruptions down the road if and when they occur. Yeah, I think I think a lot of companies want to get away from the are the idea of any sort of disruption, whether it's you know uh, the pandemic in China or the Ukraine Russia incidents, and you know realizing how much they contributed to the whole global economy. 
getting away from those and be ready. It's almost like diversifying your your investment portfolio, which yeah. has always been yeah. like the, a better idea than just having stock in one company. Um, all right, exactly. I want to jump on to uh, the next the next kind of um, t- trend of the year, and this is around artificial intelligence. Um, a lot of coverage over the last few weeks about this whole Chat GPT, uh, OpenAI uh, dialogue creator. Um, but not only just chat GPT, but like just the idea of artificial intelligence um, and machine learning. We've seen it in the robotic space and we've seen it as as companies are moving towards more of an edge computing uh, design and architecture on, uh, for high industrial robotics and other types of things. You know, I, we did a show here with with uh, Chris and I, Chris behind the the, the cameras here. And we, we talked about ChatGPT and 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 Lenza AI, and both of us were stunned about how cool it was in terms of what an AI could do. Uh, I wanted to ask you guys too: have, have you guys played around with this stuff, and does it impress you, or are you less impressed than than maybe you know a regular guy like me? Um, and then, how do you see sort of this evolving? Do you think that people should take a, a, a hands-off approach? Do you think they should embrace this? What are your thoughts, um, Ken? I'm just going to start with you because okay. That, that's fine. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting because I, I want to raise a cautionary tale here. Okay. First of all, it's very cool technology. And I think one of the things about how chat GBT, GPT and some of these other things from the Open AI, AI Foundation, they sort of caught the imagination of more mainstream tech users. It's like, wow, we can do this or we can try that yeah. or we can have this generate this content. Um, we've had a couple of uh, pieces on Computer World sort of raising some red flags because if you're looking at something like, you know, you, you want you, you use the uh, open AI chat GBT to create some content like you, you want to, you know, let's say you want to write a story or have a, you know, a term paper about some particular topic and it can generate, you know, pretty natural sounding English language right. paragraphs of information. But you have no idea exactly where that information is coming from. I mean, we've talked about it as editors, you know, like, is there a role in, in journalism for something like this? And one of the things Mark that, has promised me that it's not going to replace me yet. So. Well, I, I, as long as it doesn't replace editors and reporters, I think we're all for it. Well, have you guys that. have you tried to, to ask the yeah. chat GPT to write a news story about about something? Yeah. And does it come up with does it come up with direct quotes? Because I always felt like if if you had a direct quote in a, in an article, that it that it sounds more legitimate as a news story. I I've asked it to write stories and it hasn't given me quotes yet. Yeah. <laughs> but the uns, the unsettling thing is the, the language is is fine, but again, as Ken points out, you don't know where the information is coming from, and sometimes it makes things up or is absolutely wrong. Yeah. So, I mean, I could see it being used to give you maybe a framework or or you know, let's say you could you could tell chat GPT write me a 600 word story on the the US China chip war right. right and it'll write you a story and the language will be fine but again you don't know where the information is coming from however it might bring up points that you wouldn't have thought of right so it can be helpful in suggesting things but um until we can solve the issue of providence of the data where is the information coming from there's just no way at least as an editor, I could rely on it to to be a a human like reporter. Right. Well, I, I, yeah, so it's I, like. Go ahead, John. Oh, I was just. Say, it, it reminds me. I haven't played around with it extensively, so grain of salt. Um, but what I have seen of it reminds me a lot of like a student writing a paper, like a like a talented student writing a paper mm-hmm. the day before it's due without having done the research. It's <laughs> like it sounds very natural. It's very, it, but it'll be very confidently wrong about something. Yeah. And and as That's Ken says, it, will, it. Yeah. it will frequently just kind of make things up. But well, they, but like plausibly, which is which is really interesting and again vaguely terrifying in some ways. Yeah, but. I think Joanna Stern from the Wall Street Journal used it to write to see if it could pass an AP literature uh, test or or <laughs> you know write an essay for AP literature, and it did. I mean, I oh I would God. I I might just tell my kids to say, hey, if you've got. Well, okay, I'm not going to tell them that. But I mean, it's like the cliff, <laughs> cliff notes. Yeah, you don't want to open that door. Well, not, I mean, if they, the had kids, an essay, no. if they had an essay and they hadn't written the book yet, I mean, you know, do they write an essay around it? I don't know. I would use it as maybe use this as a framework 
and then maybe come then and then rewrite it yourself or I don't know. I mean, yeah. so I, I I plugged in. I asked ChatGPT to write me an opening for this show. Like, hey, you know, write write a, a script that that gives an introduction to the top technology trends of the year. And it came up with three or four of the technology trends that we were going to talk about anyway. Um, so yeah. it did know that. But when you read it, it's just sort of it's just got no soul. I, it hasn't figured out the soul part of it yet. Where. <laughs> the turn of phrase that that sounds interesting. It it's and and again, I'm gonna piss off a bunch of marketing people right now. It sounds like it was written by someone in marketing, um, or <laughs> like like a one of those blog posts that you see for uh, you know. And I used to write some of these too, so I'm not gonna criticize it too much. Maybe, but maybe you're the Chat GPT. GPT. Maybe team. it's just me. Yeah. Uh, maybe, I, maybe it can do your job. I was talking. Yeah. About, I was talking about this this subject too with a bunch of my uh, friends that I play D and D with. Oh God, I'm such a nerd. Um, but um, they were talking about he was you know the dungeon master that, that that runs our games. He was using it to actually come up with some backstory ideas for or write a story about cer- certain characters. And the more specific you get about the character, the better the story comes. So I took For the my record, car- I want to help myself so as nerdy I, enough to find that really cool. Yeah. So I have a so I have a lizard man character who's a fighter and a gladiator. And so I told ChatGPT to write a backstory for this gladiator and and use that to sort of then build on my role playing character later. And it came up with I think six paragraphs, but the story it came up with was generic if as you would think a, a, a gladiator character was like, you know, the, the you know, at, so I'm going to just read you some of it, okay? This and again, as a young <laughs> lizard man, your character was taken from your home and forced into the brutal world of gladiatorial combat. You were trained to fight and entertain, pitting your skills against all manner of creatures both monstrous and intelligent. And again, it, there's five other paragraphs where he gets rescued from uh, rebels that are trying to take over, the, you know, the little town, and you fight in the rebellion, and then you win, and and but then you were hurt, and then you decide, well, I'm going to become a freelance adventurer, which is what you would write anyway as a as a gladiator. Like my original backstory for this character was, yeah, I was freed from the gladiator pits, and you know, and now I'm I'm looking for adventure on my own. So, but again, question, this question, G. it did this in five seconds. That's like. Yeah, yeah no, that that it is it is fast. But question, I mean, and this is what I want want us to think about with this stuff, the the basis of the information for which that is written, where is that coming from? Because as Mark to Mark's point, if you can't vet any of this stuff, and to John's point, you know, the 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 AI here doesn't understand the difference between something that's real and something that may be right. misinformation, disinformation, ten years out of date. You know, right. and, and so it's pulling together from a I don't know what sources, but without knowing what the sources are, right. you know, I'm not sure. Other, Can now, you dig state, into the site to see if it, if they give you a list of like, did, have they talked about where what the training sort, what the training data is for something like this? Or is it just like, I, well, I don't know. We just scanned the Internet. We just sure. basically have tell the AI to basically scan the Internet. It's probably read a bunch of sto- like for this D&D type thing. It's probably scanned a bunch of stories. Uh, around Dungeons and Dragons, and it, you know, I think again the the term gladiator. So it's like, all right, well, here's the history of you know they probably went to Wikipedia and find out what gladiators did. Type well, of and thing. then then you've got an issue of intellectual property. Okay, so the well, you know yeah. Chat GPT is repackaging this stuff. Does it have the legal right to use it? Do you have the legal right to use it? It's like yeah. there. Yeah. Th- this is technology that is once again far outpacing our ability to to you know regulate it uh, you know and deal with it you know legally well it's, so it's, could it's, could it's any interesting. could anybody take advantage of this like we're you know i think today there was a story that microsoft announced that it's going to integrate some of the chat gpt stuff into yeah. bing which is like yeah. wow right. we're going to make bing relevant again <laughs> or, right <laughs> Good luck. Again, was it relevant <laughs> before? Oh, that's true. Make right, Bing right, relevant right. and sorry, then not say again. No, yeah, <laughs> well, but, I, you know, but what, what can, can a business use this or is this all, is this just going to be a cool parlor trick? Well, you know, it can be used by, for, you know, we're editors, writers, so we focus on the, the natural language ability. But if you're a programmer, you can ask for help on programming. Right. Uh, I, I asked uh, ChatGPT last night, what programming tools would you use to create neural networks to create new video games? And it gave me uh, uh, an answer in four sections. It mentioned TensorFlow, PyTorch, uh, Keras, is that how you pronounce it? Uh, and Deep Learning 4J. 
And then I asked it to give me an example of deep learning 4J code that I could use to start building a neural network for creating a new video game. And guess what? In about a minute, it spat out wow. tons of code yeah. for me. And I've uh, talked to programmers who have done this, and they uh, a couple of them said, "Well, yeah, it spat out code for me. The code actually didn't work, but it, again, <laughs> it gave me it gave me a framework." To, to take off from, much like we could possibly use it as a framework for ideas for a story, Homer, programmers could use it as to get ideas for programming, you know, different approaches, even maybe sample code that they could tweak. Yeah. Yep. Uh, no, well, I'm, not, I'm not a big time programming. Pro program. Are you sure you're not announcing your next career, Mark? Uh, you know, you're <laughs> yeah. going to be designing uh, games with neural networks, right? Yeah, John, yeah, that, go ahead. You had a, you had an idea, you had a thought. Yeah, I mean, I think that's, you know, that's kind of the point. I think, you know, as it is, what it is now and what we're all reading about now um, is is a parlor trick. But, you know, where, where it gets really interesting is where, you know, this is an open, unless I badly misunderstand something here, this is an open source project. You know, people are going to come in and, like, use it to for, you know, much more specific things. So, you know, we talked about its limitations, you know, from the natural language perspective. You know, could you, as, say, a PR firm, you know, give it a set of bounds, you know, give it a set of information to work from and have it, you know, generate press releases at the touch of a button or, you know, things like that. Or, you know, even much more, as we've been talking about with, you know, Mark's nascent video games company, um, it's, you know, there are, you know, just a, using it to kind of give you the the framework, the idea right. of how, you know, a, big, a given project ought to be structured. I always thought that press releases were already written by a robot anyway, like the, most of the ones that <laughs> I see. Read that one. Yeah. Yeah. Um, again, I, I think what's interesting now is to see the creative things that come out of this and see, you know, whether or not then, but, but again, I think your point on, on the, the, where is this coming from and what's the data? And again, I wouldn't do it for any sort of serious thing yet, but maybe this is just the first step towards, towards that. Have you guys played That's around with the, the artwork stuff? Have you seen the Dolly and the, uh, the yeah. lens of AI <laughs> stuff and Incredible. Incredible. Yeah. I, as, as a proof of concept, it's amazing. It's very cool. And and this has just happened within the last year. Like the the yeah. early stuff was was goofy. Like and you could just yeah. tell it was just awful AI, just horrible images that you'd get. But now you could actually, you know, with the Dolly two that that came out, you could have it do some really amazing looking artwork. And I was impressed yeah. with just how how good it made me look on on my selfies. <laughs> I was like, I don't, you know, because oh. it was almost like actor level quality that. You know, they, yeah. they took away all my yeah. flaws, right? So, yeah. all right, moving on. Apple, hey, all right, Ken, here we go again. Apple, what can we expect from them this year? Um, I think from a consumer tech side, I'm I'm excited to see if they actually come out with their AR, VR uh, headset goggles. That might push the AR, VR market forward a little bit. Um, but beyond that, what else do you see f uh, from Apple this year? Did Apple have a good year last year, in your in your opinion, or... Um, yeah. And again, I, and I know yeah. it's tough to it's tough for you to criticize Apple. So, tr just I tell am me. an Apple guy. I know. I admit it. <laughs> All right. Uh, yeah. Well, no. Apple had a good Apple. Apple did have a good year. You, you're you know you're everybody's waiting for the Apple goggles, AR, VR, Apple reality, whatever it's called. The assumption is that that is real and will be released this spring or maybe by WWDC in June. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, you know, again though, I'm I'm it's this is another one of those examples, and I have to wait and see what what Apple puts out. I'm just not quite sure what the product, who the product is designed for. I, I don't think it's going to be designed for consumers off the bat. So it may be something for um, designers, architects, engineers, you know, who need to have some sense of a virtual space that they're designing or working in. Um, that's a guess. I don't know. Yeah. But uh, I think it will, you know, Apple will probably surprise us with some very cool technology around that. Um, real quick, you know, looking at what's been going on the last two or three years and what I expect to continue this year and going forward from Apple, Apple's done a surprising amount of work to worm its way into the enterprise and to, you know, to make it, I mean, it started off obviously with the devices, the iPhone, the iPad, Macs, everybody has thought they were for designers and artists, you know, but everybody, not everybody, but a lot of people have these devices. And so Apple has become very good at helping companies manage, provision, protect, secure, you know, with mobile, with MDM stuff, uh, mobile application management, things like that. So I would just say, you know, the, the untold story or the lesser told story is that Apple's really 
um, making a name for itself okay. in uh, in enterprise IT, kind of coming in the back door that way. I, I don't know, Mark, Mark or John, do you guys see anything like that from you know from what you've been reporting or hearing? We don't. Well, first of all, I, I should mention that in, in, in a computer world story written by I think Johnny Evans uh, mentioned that Jamf, which which supports yeah. Mac products, uh, confirmed ten consecutive quarters of Apple in the enterprise growth uh, as Macs see wider deployment across every business, and that apparently has not been slowing down. So they've definitely seemed to have uh, momentum in, in, in the enterprise. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, I think part of that is also this kind of consumerization of tech. You know, uh, over the last ten years, uh, you know, IT departments have sort of been forced to allow more choice among staff as to the sort of devices. Uh, Some, sometimes grudgingly yeah. accept that choice, right? Right, right. I, right. you know, when I when I rejoined Foundry here, like I was given the choice, and I said, you know, I I want I want this only because. I've just been using it for the last 10 years. It's It just makes me more comfortable with, but all of the software is still would be available on any other computer if, if I wanted it. It's just, again, I did think that they just didn't want to make waves with the new guy, this this guy. <laughs> you know, and, and I mean, we, I, I, again, back to chips, Apple, of course, has been, you know, has is producing its own Apple Silicon now. Um, you know, they've done really well in market. Yeah. The M2, you know, well, first with the M1, the M2, expecting an M3 maybe a Mac Pro. So I would say between all of those, you know, different things going on and the Apple reality glasses or whatever, um, I think Apple's certainly well positioned for a good 2023. I, I think it, so it is interesting that you think that this would be an enterprise play for these AR VR glasses. Does that diminish the excitement from the rest of the Apple community if, no. if they actually no. come out? Like, th that wouldn't matter, right? If it was five, th it was no. $3,000, I mean, you're still going to get, get one, Don't get me wrong. Right? I, do, I do not expect to be buying Apple reality glasses this year. I mean, I, oh, I would okay. love to. I'm, no, seriously, because it's a sort of, I, I, again, unless they have come up with some use that I can't envision, and that's very possible, um, it's something that I think they'll need to put out a product that has certain specific uses and then let developers take that and build on it and build out right. you know in terms of of, of, of expanding the 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 footprint, I guess, of, of, of people who would be buying it. Yeah, I mean, you know, so, from the AR VR perspective, you know, we've been seeing VR stuff for 10 years now, I want to say. And it's never, you know, everyone keeps saying this is the year, this is the year, this is the year. But this is technically the year where Sony's going to come out with its second one for the PlayStation. Uh, Meta slash Oculus keeps coming out with, with, with versions that keep reducing the price. I think they, with 5G networking and possibly Wi-Fi 6, you've now got a wireless component. You don't have to have a headset that has wires all over the place. But again, that's more gaming and entertainment. I still don't think they've solved the issue of guys with glasses or people with glasses and, and motion sickness. I, 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 you know, the Sony, the first Sony one gave me motion sickness when I tried it. Um, it's fun to play, it's, but then I wouldn't do it long term. Uh, again, yeah. you've got. I've actually like had just, pretty good luck with the, the with the HP Reverb, but oh, we're using John. We're, in we're terms using of it for what gaming, John. Yeah, that's what. Yeah, um, and that's that was actually sort of the point I was thinking about is that you know I, it's it's really cool for you know people in weird little nerdy entertainment niches like you know people who like flight sims like me, right. um, and you know it's it's wonderful for that. But I think you know, we, and I think Ken's exactly right is you know it's going to take a lot you know. A whole ecosystem has to sort of spring up around it. You know, there has to be so much more development. You know, enterprise applications for this kind of thing, you know, they need to be a lot more robust. You know, they need to be um, a lot more reliable, you know, for, I don't know, like the, the AR use case where, you know, you've got a technician, you know, with, you know, sort of like an overlay, you know, being shown where a part goes or yeah. like, you know, how to, or diagnosing a problem that way. Um, you know, that's that's been talked about as as we said you know, for, for years now. Um, and I, you know, it just doesn't feel as though it's, you know, in the immediate offing. Um, and I'm, you know, wondering, you know, and it'll be interesting to see whether, you know, um, Apple getting into the market really moves the needle there. If that's the case, then it would probably be at the WWDC, right? Ken, like for, because again, if you're promoting it to get developers excited you about think, it, you would. 
Or, or you announce it in the spring and then demonstrate it at WWDC and roll it out in the fall. I, you know, it's hard to say because Apple's schedule of releases is is has really, you know, it used to be very regular. It's much less regular now. I mean, th- at one point, this was expected last fall, and then it was pushed back to after the first of the year, and then seems like maybe the spring. So, yeah, at the rate we're going, it might be WWDC. Yeah. Well, if once, I mean, the once, they make, is, once they make that announcement, Ken, I'm sure you and I will have a, a long conversation about this on camera. I would love to be able to try it out. What I was going to say, though, is, you know, if, if there is a company that can take a technology like this and produce something that has resonance in the market, it's probably Apple. Yeah. You know, whatever that is. They, they've done it before, right? With phones, sure. with uh, with music. Yeah. But I don't know. I really wonder if we're going to see widespread use in the enterprise anytime in the vaguely near. What's the future. use case? I keep coming yeah. back to yeah. what. Yeah. What do I need this yeah. for? Like, you know? yeah, to talk to you guys in this setting, I don't particularly want to put on special <laughs> glasses or that make us feel like we're in the same room. Right. I think. But, I think what we would right. need is more of an AR versus the VR part of it. If it's AR right. and you know, and it, and it looks like a fashionable set of glasses and not remember like the Google Glass stuff that yeah. was just. Oh my it goodness. Was, yeah. I think it's a good point. Yeah. It yeah. has to. Also, be, you know, you have to make one of people wear them. At, 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 you know. Well, yeah. Well, that's the other thing, Keith. I mean, it's kind of it's kind of a strange thought if an enterprise making you put on a specific piece of <laughs> apparel to do something with what's that body. apple tv movie uh where you split the brain and you know you oh severance yeah great show severance thank you i love the it the tv show severance yeah. yes oh, it's I like finish that. watching that yeah. That's a great show. All right. Hey, so yeah, I, there's, it's there's, really great. All right. We could talk forever on this, but I want to do one more yeah. before we, we kind of cut out here. Uh, the yeah. tech layoffs that we saw at the end of 2022, you know, I thought maybe this was a seasonal thing. It was the end of the year. Companies wanted to get their balance sheets in, in order. They realized that they, they were probably too uh heavy in certain areas but n- we're now seeing that continue into january amazon just had another uh big announcement of of a lot of of layoffs um do you guys think that this is uh, still seasonal this is like you know maybe at the end of the christmas season when retail does it or it does is this the starting point of something that could last th- through through 2023 mark you want to you want to jump us up, start us off on this well one? i i think uh, what what the companies are saying basically what is that they uh, you know the, the big the big companies especially those with a big retail businesses right like like Amazon uh-huh. um, they're saying that uh, they overhired during the pandemic right Amazon you know the retail sales did really well because people were in lockdown and so right. they went to e-commerce they hired a lot of people and now oops. You know, we're heading into what might be a recession. They want to balance their books. Right. So they're laying off about 20,000 people. And uh, on a smaller scale, that's true throughout the industry. So um, if you want to look at things positively, you, you could say, okay, they're cutting back now so they can weather the storm through 23. And if things don't get a lot worse, they're good for the moment. Yeah. But we don't know what's going to happen, right? So uh, if we knew what was going to happen, we'd be rich by the end of the year because we could place our bets on the stock market, right? So we don't know what's going to happen. But I would say hopefully the biggest layoffs have have happened, you know, end of last year going into the next few weeks, going into the next month. But yeah. I don't have a crystal ball. Yeah, I mean, you, you saw Salesforce and, and neither too. do the economists, yeah. right? The economists don't know what's going on. Right, so. right. I mean, Salesforce did announce, I think, ten percent of its workforce yes. would be laid off. Do you think that mm-hmm. this has a domino effect, though? Like, you, you it, or is it just focus on your company and see what your, works for your company? Or because again, I've, I, 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 we've done a video too where I've talked to Lucas from Computer World about um, whether this year is a good year to sort of look for a job before you get laid off. And so go watch that video if you if you're interested in that topic. But, uh, you know, do you think that, again, this is something that might just be the next couple couple weeks, couple months, and then things will normalize? Or, but, but again, we can't really predict that either. I just, I, I just was going to say real quick, it felt like for a while in 2022, when we first started getting these reports of layoffs, this was coming when inflation was was running rampant when the you know the russian ukraine war was going on 
uh, you know, there were COVID problems in China and it felt like all oh, hell was breaking loose in so many places that once one big company started announcing layoffs, others were like, oh God, I guess we should be doing layoffs because it felt like there was this domino effect throughout yeah. the year, you know, but if you look at the economy, in at least in the US, okay, yeah, there've been some inflationary pressures, but unemployment, is it like 3.5%? In the tech industry, it's like 2% and change. So, I mean, if you're going to be, la- God forbid, you know, but if you're going to be laid off, this is not the worst economy in the world to be looking for that job, right. you know? Right. That's a good point. And, and let's keep in mind, a lot of these layoffs are not uh, uh, among uh, uh, tech personnel, right? A lot of layoffs are corporate um, support staff. Mid-managers, uh, mid-level managers. Yeah, people on the retail side, uh, but not the core tech teams. I mean, there have been layoffs in, right. in, among tech personnel, um but i don't think the bulk of the layoffs have been uh for tech specific personnel so i think we need to differentiate between a tech company laying off and exactly who they're laying off right um i mean i i don't we don't really know for sure yet but the big amazon layoffs I don't, you know, the bulk of them didn't take place, for example. Well, we know this. The bulk of them didn't take place uh, for AWS. Right. 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 So, and well, that's their biggest. So that, more, most of those people are okay. Tech. Right. Yeah. And if you do, again, to Ken's point, if you do get laid off and you're a tech professional, you know what? There's a dearth of tech talent the, in, in, in not only the U.S., but in the West and around the world. Right. So right. You, it's a terrible thing to be laid off, but... Um, there are there are job opportunities out there. All right, we are coming up on kind of where I want to stop, so <laughs> um, we're going to end on a good note here. Uh, we're going to come back in next year and see how we did in terms of some of these big trends. I'm sure that Uh-oh. you know something <laughs> something news like again, you can't really predict the news, so maybe there'll be a bigger bigger trend that we miss. But I think in general, these are the the big trends that that uh, people should be uh, watching if they're into technology. Uh, so uh, again, I want to thank my uh, guests on this one, John Gold, Mark Ferranti, and Ken Mingus. Thanks as always for joining us, Thanks. and uh, that's all the time we've got for today's episode. If you like what you saw, hit that like, subscribe button. Uh, join us each each new week for technology news and analysis on Today in Tech. I'm Keith Shaw. Thanks for watching.